Um, next up, we have Theo Brown. You may know him from his YouTube videos, Twitch streams. He's the founder of Ping Labs and has some very interesting takes on GraphQL and API tech in general to talk to you about today. Welcome, Theo. Thank you so much, Lee, for making me both the second best TypeScript YouTuber and now the second best dressed at GraphQL Conf. If you guys don't know me, as I just hinted at, I'm primarily known as a YouTuber in the tech space. I do a lot of content about full stack development, primarily web and TypeScript based stuff. I used to work at Twitch where I actually helped us move over to GraphQL. And a little thing a lot of people don't know is that my first time doing tech content was actually being a guest on the Apollo podcast talking about how we adopted GraphQL at Twitch. So GraphQL has always been core to my journey as a content creator and a huge part of my evolution going from back end to front end as a software developer. I was almost entirely doing back end before GraphQL was introduced at Twitch. And when it was, it was the first time I had the confidence to move over to front end because I didn't feel like my communications with the back end were holding me back anymore. Having this language that we could use to communicate between the different teams allowed me to move more confidently on either side of that GraphQL schema. But none of that is why I'm here today. The reason I was invited here today is actually my Twitter, specifically this tweet that I made. The best I can TLDR this is the top left corner, if you're the same person or team working on the front end and back end and both are in TypeScript, the benefits of using a solution tailor-made for that, like TRPC, is just impossible to beat. Having inference from back to front, having right-click go to definition on my components bring me to the actual back-end code making that data appear. And that relationship and agility is really hard to describe, so I'm going to take a minute and really quickly show you guys. This is an example of a TRPC router, similar to a GraphQL resolver, and I have an example endpoint here. You'll notice that the input isn't a type definition, it's actually a validator. This is similar to how in a form you would check to make sure the values in any field are correct. But you use this to define what this endpoint's allowed to take. In this case, it's an object that has a GraphQL ID that's a string with a minimum of five characters in length. The dot query means this is a query. They have a similar concept of queries and mutations. That can be, a, that's an async function, can be synchronous. You see the input type is inferred directly off of the Zod object. There is no type definitions in this file is a really important detail of what makes this pattern so powerful. And whatever you return here gets inferred on the client, which you'll see that as const. The reason I put that there is now when we look at this code on the client side, that exact type is inferred directly on the client. There was no type definitions written here to do that. All of this comes from the server side through inference. And if I was to right click on some endpoint and hit go to definition in VS Code, it will bring me directly to that backend code. And if I was to make a change of the shape of what that's returning, that would, again, immediately be shown on the client side. Without even saving the files, you'll see type errors on your client side when you're making changes in your server code because this all exists within the TypeScript server. There isn't the compiler step getting this information from one side to the other. It already exists because TypeScript has it. And as I've shown here, without any TypeScript being written, no type definitions anywhere, we're successfully inferring data over the wire, so to speak. But I'm not here to talk about TRPC either because we have something that's even simpler, more powerful, and also in a lot of ways more complex because React server components complicate things. It is an incredible new model. And I mean, I'll just ask quickly, who here has played with React server components already? Let's see some hands. For the audience at home, that's about a fourth or so of the people who are in here right now. Really exciting to see, but also remember, we're the enthusiasts. So who's at least interested in playing with React server components? Who's heard of them before I put that on the slide here? OK, now finally we've got about half the hands up. So rather than show you that, I'm going to go make the TRPC example a little more complex. Here I'm fetching some data from database using the ORM drizzle. Any TypeScript ORM will work here. The key is that the type is still being inferred off of this return. So again, I go to the client, and now I have this type definition. It's coming straight from that SQL or that server code that's basically just SQL. Like we've all hopefully written some SQL before. Oh, that button's not working my bad. There we go. Yeah, we've all written some SQL before, so that should look pretty similar. The type's inferred out. But we still have this separation of files where we have the server code and the client code. These are in different files. Inference is going between the different files. Server components change that because I'm just waiting for this data inside of my component. Now, out of the audience here, who gets a little scared when they see something that looks like SQL inside of their client code? <laughs> 
expected. The important thing here is that this isn't client code. This code will never run on a user's device. This is what makes server components so different, is that this isn't a different way to fetch some data in a component. This is actually not sending JSON to the client at all. This code runs on a server, generates effectively HTML that gets sent to the client to render HTML instead of having to send code and JSON that has to be parsed. There's no more transforming data three different times on the server just to send it to the client to transform it one final time and then hopefully render, assuming the JavaScript's already loaded too. This is also ergonomically incredible because the distance between where the data is defined and where I'm using it is now however many lines of code I choose to put between them. And the shorter you make those distances, the easier it is to create new features, solve existing problems, iterate, scale, and eventually move off of this tech if something else makes more sense in the future. An argument I love to make is when you use the simplest possible technology for the problem you have now, it actually makes it easier to solve the problems in the future because moving from a simple technology will always be easier than guessing what complex problems you'll have in the future. And this works at every scale, be it a small company just getting started or a big company trying a new project or exploring in Greenfield. If you can make a simple solution, it will make finding that complex solution in the future significantly easier. But it is important to recognize the difference of complexity here because something like TRPC still has that separation of server and client files and a distance between them, as well as a complex inference system built into it to get that data from the server to the client and vice versa. In GraphQL, as we just saw in the last two talks where I didn't understand half of what either of them were saying, <laughs> can get really, really complex really fast. But if we're being honest, this isn't just complexity, this is capability. All these solutions can do different things for different users and solve different problems for different developers, different teams, and companies. And I kind of want to emphasize the differences between these things and where they do and don't make sense so that we can make sure we're picking the right solution for the problems that we ourselves are solving in our work. First, we have, as mentioned before by Mark, full stack type safety, which thankfully we've, we've agreed, if you're not type safe, you're making things harder for no good reason. Type safety, without question, just makes life easier if you have it. it you, a whole class of errors go away. And as someone who used to be a huge fan of Elixir and still loves the language, moving from Ruby and Elixir over to TypeScript was like, oh, I'm not overthinking every line of code anymore. It was a really nice change for me. Another big one that thankfully we all agree is table stakes now is batching requests. We shouldn't have to force our users to have endless waterfalls to get the data they need to render their components and show the correct UI and build quality experiences for users. We've seen incredible waterfall chaos where people fetch different, from different APIs on every single component in their apps and your network tab looks terrifying as a result. And if you can batch those into individual requests, it makes things easier both on the server side and on the client side, as well as providing a much faster experience overall. And with new stuff like Deferred coming to GraphQL as well as Suspense and React Server Components, the ability to opt out of the batching when it makes sense is getting better than ever. We also have a separation of backend and front end. I know it doesn't seem like that with the React code, but as I hinted at before, a React Server Component will only ever run on the server. If you want something to run on the client, you have to break that out into a separate file, mark it as use client, and now you can't use any of your backend code in that component. That separation allows you to still have this mental model where server code runs on the server, client code might run on the server, but it's designed to run on the client. But what about the reusable logic across clients? This is an important one. If you're working on a web app and suddenly you need a mobile app to address a different market, it's super important to have a way to get the data you need there. And if you're using something like server components, it gets a little complex because that logic will often be so closely tied to the specific web application, the specific implementation of that itself, you can't just use that API elsewhere. Where with TRPC, as long as you're inside of a mono repo using TypeScript, you can have as many clients as you wish and still have all of the benefits of TRPC's strong inference. However, if you're not in a mono repo, that's where things get more complex and we start to see the problems for those solutions on the left. And I'll be frank, you probably need a compiler step once you break out of mono repo land. If the TypeScript files don't exist in the same directory, it's really hard for the TypeScript server to infer things. So at that point, something like GraphQL quickly becomes the only solution. And as I mentioned there before, 
non-TypeScript language support is an important detail too. CRPC does have an open API wrapper where it will generate a traditional API and create docs and everything for you, but it's not the strong point of TRPC. It's not the goal of that project. And if you're trying to support a Swift developer on the iOS app, a Kotlin developer on the Android app, and all these other languages, or the backend team is really, really committed to using other languages, GraphQL makes a lot of sense as almost a translation layer, or as I like to call it, a communication layer between those different developers and those different teams. It allows for developers who don't speak the same language, who live in these different programming worlds, to have a one point to come to and agree and go back, do their thing, come back, link it together, and either it works or someone gets fired. And that's really nice as someone who has been arguing with developers for so long that it's now my specific job. But we do need to have a conversation about languages. I want, let's just ask the audience. How many people here work in TypeScript some amount? Not it's your whole job, but you are paid or have been paid at some point in your careers to write TypeScript. Let's see some hands. For the audience at home, pretty much every person here has raised their hand. Who also works in another language some amount of their job? Roughly the same amount of people. Now, one last question. Whose job would be harder if they couldn't use TypeScript anywhere in their stack? Almost the same number of hands still. The point I'm trying to make here, it's a bit spicy. <laughs> TypeScript is a necessary part of providing a good experience to users. Almost all of us serve the web at some point in some amount. Almost all of us have to work in the crazy world that we now know as JavaScript. And we use TypeScript because it makes that better, and we use TypeScript because it's become the industry standard for solving these problems. Almost all of us are working on something that provides data to a website or might even be the website itself. And as such, we kind of have to use TypeScript. The spicy part of this is why are we using something else? The argument I make whenever I'm consulting with companies, talking to teams, working with old friends, talking to the startups I work with constantly, is why are you using another language? Because you are making things harder as soon as you bring another language in. And there's a lot of good reasons to do that. There are absolutely incredible reasons why you would want to bring another language into your back end. But in a world where these tools and technologies have gotten as good as they have, that's the question you need to answer before we get to the GraphQL conversation. GraphQL's unique strength is not that it's the best way to make an API. It's not that it solves every single problem ever. The unique strength is how it defines this communication method between the server and the client. You can do so much with that, and we've had incredible innovation from the networking side to the actual tools on both the client and the server to the crazy compiler stuff to the inference of generating SDLs based on the things that we're doing in our code itself. But in order to bring in GraphQL, you have to introduce another language. And we're now in a world where so many projects, so many developers, and so many users will be better served sticking to one language from the back to the front. And if you're going to introduce another language, GraphQL should not be the first one you introduce. It should be the one that solves the problems between the other languages you've introduced and the boundaries that inherently exist between those different things. I really, really believe that if we take the opportunity to build the simplest possible way, even if it turns out TypeScript's the wrong thing in your back end because you're spending way too much money running these functions and you just need to rewrite it in Go or Rust or whatever else, or even just expose it through GraphQL so that your mobile developers can use Swift with it. When you have the simplest possible thing, composable functions that run on a back end, moving those anywhere else is easier than starting on the wrong foot and starting somewhere more complex just to eat that complexity down the road and end up somewhere you never expected in the first place. Because no project at any scale actually goes how you expect initially. And GraphQL is really good once you've hit that threshold where you've been running into the same problems on all these sides. You have teams that are fighting and getting in each other's ways. And you have infrastructure that's struggling to scale or serve the users in different places. Run into those problems head first. Don't assume they're going to exist. Start simple, build towards complexity, and complain at me on Twitter if you hated anything I had to say here. Thank you guys all so much. This was really fun. I can't believe you invited me to GraphQL Conf, but always happy to be here. Thank you all.